Well, welcome to our exploration of the five horsemen of the apocalypse. And of course, we're going to initially focus on the famous four, the famous four horsemen. And we're going to explore this time the black horse. And we're in session one of two sessions that will cover this topic. And we're going to zero right in on Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And uh, when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so there you have it. And uh, we're going to, first of all, put this in context. Before we jump into the details, let's not forget where this shows up in the Apocalypse and uh, the Black Horse. We're going to talk about the context and its identity to begin with, and then we're going to focus on the topic, which strangely enough is hyperinflation, and we'll try to demonstrate that. And that'll set the stage for our second session, in which we're going to talk about the engine of power, the trail of blood, and give you a strange tool to use called Bayes' Theorem. And we'll explore that a little bit, and how they use it to reverse causality. And it's a tool that may surprise you, and that's one thing you can carry away from the series. But let's start right away by refreshing our perspective of the context we're dealing with here. The book of Revelation has its own outline in verse 19 of chapter 1, where John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Those are three sections that profile the entire book of Revelation, or the Apocalypse. And uh, the things which he had seen, when they finished chapter 1, he will have seen this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has a description in chapter 1 that includes identities that are then used to tie the whole book together. Then he gets to the second section, the things which are the seven churches. They actually existed at that time, so they're present tense. And the, then from that, we go to the things which shall be metatauta hereafter, the things which follow the churches. And that metatauta is a key partitioning phrase that we'll notice as we go forward. So the things which thou hast seen is chapter 1. The things which are, the existing present tense things, are the letters to seven churches. And then the things which are after that constitutes the bulk of the book. It continues with chapters 4 and 5, in which the saints are in heaven. That's important for you to understand. Many people miss that and thus get confused about the whole, what follows. Then comes chapter 6 through 19, which details the period of time we, we know as the 70th week of Daniel. The 69 weeks are uh, shockingly, precisely uh, fulfilled, but there's one week, uh, a, week a, a group of seven years left. And they will include six seals that are open, six trumpets that are blown, six bowls. And each of these are somewhat a logarithmic pr a procession within each one. And that's a speculation, but you can come to your own conclusions as you study. We'll be zeroing in on chapter 6. But it's important to understand we're in chapter 6 and to really fully appreciate what precedes that. And uh, we, uh, we are gonna, we're going to open the seven sealed scroll, the title deed of the earth, if you will. And we'll notice that in the pattern here, there's always six things and then a change of subject for a brief, what we call a parenthetical segment, before you get to the seventh. And that, that occurs again when you get to the seventh one. That turns out to be uh, seven trumpets. And we're treated to six of those and then a change of subject. It, chapters 8 and 9 take you up through the sixth one, and then chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, those chapters are all inserted as a change of subject, a parenthesis, if you will, before dealing with the seventh trumpet. 
And when you get the seventh trumpet, you have seven bowls. And there again, we have this strange pattern imposed where you have six of them and then a parenthetical. In this case, the parenthesis is just a little one verse insertion. But it's useful to understand the design. There is an architecture to the whole book that's meaningful. So I highlight that to you to refresh your memory on that issue. So, Metatauta, after things, chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened, John writes. A door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That word in the Greek, thereafter, again, is the same word, metatauta. The thing after this, the things that come up following. The other subtlety that most people miss about chapter 4, when you get down to verse 5, it points out the seven lamps of fire that were on the earth in chapter 1 are now in heaven with him in heaven. That's a profound thing. It's critical to really get the sense of that as we go here. So we're in the throne room of the universe. The throne of God, chapters 2 and 3, the, the, the uh, 24 elders are described. The seven lamps from chapter 1 show up there. The sea of glass, they're now standing on it. We wash in it in the book of Ephesians. It's used as an idiom of the word we wash ourselves with. Here, they're standing on it. Is the Holy Spirit dealing in puns? I think so. Then the four living creatures, the cherubim, have this, the, the four faces that we study separately, which is worth doing. The, the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. But the 24 elders is an identity that I believe is crucial for you to come to your own terms with. David divided the priesthood in the Old Testament into 24 courses, the only place that 24 shows up in the Bible. But it also shows up in 24 identifiers in chapter 1, interestingly enough. And we also discover by studying the total Bible, there are 24 specific gaps in the text, strangely enough. The 24 identity codes are all in chapter 1, and those are used as labels of Jesus throughout the rest of the book. They're almost like a, a, a glossary or a code section if you're a computer programmer. And then you have these 24 intervals all through the Bible. And it's interesting, there's exactly 24 of those that all show up in the same sense. They're intervals in the scripture. How many? 24 again. Interesting. The 24 elders identify themselves for us. There's no guesswork here. When you get to chapter 5, verse 9, it says, They sung a new song, saying, th speaking to the Lamb, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. Call your attention to the fact they identify themselves, have redeemed us to God, made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall be reigned. It's a pers first person singular term they're using. There are 25 manuscripts that support that. And uh, kings and priests. There are only three people in the Bible that are both kings and priests. M M M uh, Melchizedek, in chapter Genesis 14, which would disappear in oblivion, except Psalm 10 takes that and celebrates that. And then the epistle to Hebrews spends three chapters amplifying, so we don't miss the point. Kings and priests are Melchizedek, the Messiah himself, and the redeemed, you and me. Strangely enough, that term is used, and here's an example of it right here. The 24 elders, we need to understand who they represent. It's crucial to, to these are not the angels. Because in chapter 7, they're, just, just, they're separate, separated. Uh, they're the redeemed of the earth. And there's a lot of confusion about this. And the manuscript evidence clearly supports this translation. And uh, only one of 24 has a doubt about it. So we'll move on here. Revelation 1.16 nails this for us. Okay, so John continues. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? Notice, it couldn't just be anybody. And no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon. And, uh, and 
We don't understand what's going on, but John did. He understood the significance. He sobbed convulsively, the Greek says. I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open the scroll and to neither look therein. So he realizes the predicament they're in. Fortunately, there's an exception. See, no man in heaven. It had to be a, it had to be a kinsman of Adam to open that scroll. It's a title deed to the earth. So one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. It's interesting, all through the book, if something has to be explained to John while he's in heaven, it's an elder that does it for him. If it's something that has to be explained about what's going on in the earth, one of the living creatures explained it. Interesting to notice that, 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 that job description. But anyway, one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And John says, I behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth through all the earth. So we have these very Jewish titles, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. Interesting. But the capstone one is the Lamb as it had been slain. How interesting it is that John the Baptist when he first introduces Jesus publicly at the beginning of his ministry, he uses that label. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. It's the Passover Lamb. And this is the way we see him presented here in, in heaven. Note the sequence here. That's what's important to get clear. I get a lot of email from people that are really confused because they don't put things in order. The 24 elders are in heaven worshiping the Lamb before he receives the scroll with the seven seals. That's an important sequence to understand. The 24 elders are in heaven worshiping the Lamb before he gets the scroll that he needs to open. It is the Lamb that then has the unique right to open the seven seals. And it's his opening of the seven seals that then sets the four horsemen out. So it's important to get this in context. There's a lot of things it doesn't refer to. This pretty much clarifies what it is alluding to. Are we together? Okay. Let's talk about the opening of this scroll in Revelation chapter 6. And when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. And we covered that one in the first horseman. I regard that as the most important mistaken identity in the Bible. It's amazing how many people misunderstand who that white horse is. Okay, so that's the first of the four horsemen. Then we see a red horse, which speaks of wars and rumors of wars. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Horses are often used to designate judgments. So that's the second horse, the red horse. Okay, then we get the third one. That's going to be our primary focus in the session. The black horse, apparently referring to inflation and famine. When I'd opened the third seed, the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And, and I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And uh, black is often connected with famine, as we'll see in the scripture. And to eat bread by weight is a Jewish expression of, of, uh, of hunger and so forth. Often, and so uh, it's uh, indicating that food was, it's a way that the Jewish phrase to indicate that food was scarce, to eat bread by weight. So, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The word measure there is a kunix, which is a measure of wheat. It's a full day's work in Homer's Odyssey. It's also the amount that every soldier consumed in the army of Xerxes under Herodotus. So that's a, a Greek term referring to a payment for a full day's work. It's a one day's payment is what basically it, it's an allusion to here. And a penny there is a day's wage, the uh, denarius, if you will. So here we have a situation that implies infl what you and I would call inflation. 
So that's the third, then and we have one left that we'll catch next time, and that's the fourth seal, the, 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 the horse of death. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, behold, a pale horse, or green horse, chloros is the word in the Greek. And, uh, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed after him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth that kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And those beasts may not be four-footed creatures. They might be microscopic creatures. But whatever. We'll get at that next time. So that's the fourth. Those are the four horsemen. Now we're going to deal with five horsemen because fortunately the main horseman shows up in chapter 19. And that's why we speak of five horsemen in the book of Revelation, not four. But these are the, fam the fabled four, if you will. It's interesting to see them uh, predicted in Ezekiel chapter 14. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, the pestilence, to cut it off from man and beast. So it's an interesting hint here in, in, back in Ezekiel 14. So we look at Revelation 6 and we see the white horse rider, the red horse rider, the black horse rider, the pale horse rider. There's four of these four horsemen. There's also one coming called, deals with the martyrs and then worldwide chaos. What's interesting about the sequence, when you study the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, we find Matthew parsing the coming troubles in the same way. The false Christ in chapter 24, four, verses 4 and 5, wars in verse 6, famines in verse 7, death in 7 and 8, martyrs in 9, worldwide. The same sequence seems to be laid out in Matthew 24 as we see here in Revelation. I point that out just to sensitize you to the architecture. I think it's useful to realize that every detail of the holy text is there by design. And some of the features of those designs are very subtle. So I want to sharpen your uh, acumen on that issue. Here's another observation I can't resist throwing in again, and that is the same colors, the white, red, black, and pale, are the same colors that are, on, are in bad company. Those are the Muslim colors, strangely enough. And uh, so, well, let's move on here. So we have the heptatic structure, where we have the strange uh, six and then a parenthesis all the way through. So be sensitive to that as we go. But it's these four, first four horsemen that we're going to zero in on, and it's among them that we're going to zero now on the black horse with a pair of balances in his hand and so forth. And when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, a, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balance in his hand. And I like the way Dean Packwood has rendered that for our cover very skillfully, because there they are. They're distinctive, even though he's riding furiously. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And those are descriptions of what you and I would call inflation. It's a, it's a price, it's about 10 times the normal rate that is measure, being measured there. And so, wheat versus barley, that's a strange thing. I've tried to track this down, I can't find a lot about it. Barley is harvested in the warmer se seasons, that is in the springtime. Whereas wheat best thrives in cooler climates, so it's harvested at the start of winter. Wheat has a weaker taste, whereas barley has a stronger taste. Barley has a higher fiber content than wheat. Barley can be cooked easily as rice, although wheat has to be milled before cooking. So wheat is the, the, apparently the preferred upscale choice. Barley is the every man's choice, apparently. The biblical text suggests a three to one price differential, favoring wheat, but at a price 10 times normal. The luxuries, the oil and wine, apparently are in denial. They're not available. That's, that's the flavor what we infer from that. Well, where do we get famines? The subject before seems to be famines. In some cases, famine is caused by uncontrollable weather circumstances, such as drought or flood, which disrupt the ability of the culture to raise crops or livestock. Famine is also the result of warfare, since the rages of war, ravages of war can disrupt the daily ongoing economic pressures of any community uh, vital to food production. What is notable about the 20th century, it may surprise you, is that most famines have been caused deliberately 
or by economic systems crippled by corrupt or dictatorial uh, governments. This is significant in that the f famines are not caused by nature or by the inability of a people to produce or gather food, but by the policies of governments looking out for their own self-interest. And it makes it impossible for their people to cope with the nature to gather and produce food. I want to highlight a lie that we encounter in our age of deceit. It's subtle, but I want to call your attention to it. Here's the definition of inflation according to Groyer's online encyclopedia. Inflation is a process in which the average level of prices increases at a substantial rate over a considerable period of time. In short, more money is required to buy a given amount of goods and services. Strangely, that's a misleading definition. That may surprise you. Subtle, but it's there. And I want you to contrast that definition with Webster's earlier unabridged dictionary back in 1957. How do they define inflation? More accurately, inflation is an increase in the amount of currency in circulation resulting in a relatively sharp and sudden fall in its value and rise in prices. Inflation is a behavior of the money. It causes things to be more dear. But it, there, there, there's a distinction between these two. It's astonishing to go through the different definitions. Investopedia, uh, economicshelp.org, uh, The Economic Times, Business Dictionary. All of these are twisted to imply that inflation is the increase in prices. No, inflation is caused by an increase in the money that causes the prices. They confuse the cause and effect. It's subtle, but it's important for us to understand. Because you and I are subject to what I like to call the hidden theft. The hidden theft. Let's assume that 5% inflation over the time of an individual that 5% devaluation applies not only to the money he earned this year, but to all the money left over from previous years. You with me so far? That dollar now is worth uh, 95, 95 cents, right? At the end of the first year, a dollar is worth 95 cents. At the end of the second year, the 95 cents is reduced again by 5%, leaving its worth at 90 cents. Doesn't sound too terrible, does it? Except it happens every year. By the time a person has worked 20 years, the government will have confiscated 64 cents of every dollar the person saved over those years, not by taxes, but by inflation. By the time he has worked 45 years, the hidden tax will be over 90%. The government will take virtually everything a person saves over his entire lifetime, not counting the income taxes. See, the, 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 the mathematics is subtle. That 0.95 is raised to a power of the years. If it's 45 years, you take the 45th power of 0.95, which turns out to leave you less than 9% of the, from what you've earned over those 45 years. Subtle and very invisible. We're dealing with now hyperinflation, when inflation gets out of control. We saw it happen repeatedly in the 20th century. It may surprise you to have, see, put this in focus. 1921 in Poland, food prices doubled every 19 days. In 1923 Germany, they doubled every four days. In 1944 in Greece, they doubled every four days. In 1946 in Hungary, food prices doubled every 15 hours. And in, in government engineered famines even more re, in our more recent times, in 1982 in Mexico, the inflation rate hit over 10,000%, driving the price of food up 100 times in 12 months. Can you imagine? 1989, Argentina. The peso was devalued three times, driving food prices up over 3,000% in a single year. In 1994, Brazil, inflation raged at 2,000% per year, making food more than 20 times as expensive. See, it had nothing to do with food availability. It has to do with the money. In 1994, in Yugoslavia, food prices doubled every 34 hours. In 2008, in Zimbabwe, they doubled, uh, they doubled every single day. If you make a list of these, it's really a shock 
to realize how often there have been hyperinflations in this century. In Angola, Argentina, Belarus, Bolivia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Brazil, Chile, Georgia, the Georgia in, 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 uh, um, in the East, uh, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Japan, Nicaragua, Peru, Poland, Romania, Turkey, Ukraine, Yugoslavia, and so forth. The one that's most indelibly tattooed in our memories is Germany in 1919 through 1923. In, uh, the food prices doubled every 49 hours. A loaf of bread in 1920 cost one mark. A loaf of bread in 1923 cost 726 million marks, by the way. The best documented hyperinflation episode in history is the one that nearly destroyed Germany between 1922 and 1923. The German government began printing unbacked paper marks, first to finance World War I and later to pay war reparations. And we have those. I'll have them on the screen for you, but let you know that we actually have the specimens of, of that period. So uh, we have the uh, 10,000 uh, mark notes. That was in 1922. Uh, we have the individual little marks, 19. But then we had f uh, sheets printed that were five, uh, half a million marks. 500,000 marks in 1st of August. And then we get to the 3 million mark notes. These are actual notes they have with 3 million marks. It's, it's astonishing to, to, to actually look and realize that these aren't hypothetical charts, you know, dots on a chart or something. These were what they lived with. This is what they had to deal with. And uh, it's, 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 sta it's staggering for us to really come to terms with that. 20 August 23. And then we had finally marks, 50 million marks on a single piece. Okay, 10 September. It finally gets to the point they don't even bother printing the back. They're trying to get them out, so the, the, back, sir, the back is blank. And uh, 31 December 23. Now, by late 1923, 300 paper mills and 2,000 printing presses worked round the clock cranking out German banknotes going through these various stages. The human toil was devastating. On average, prices doubled every three days. Can you imagine trying to live that way? It had nothing to do with the quality of the food. It had to do with the, the money. In a single month, prices exploded more than 32,000%, enough to drive prices up by a factor of 320 in a single 30-day period. My grandparents, my mother's uh, mother and father, had a restaurant that they sold to retire. They had, when, they, when it went for sale, it, they were going to get enough to retire on. By the time the formalities were uh, completed, all they received was enough to buy one loaf of bread. In those days, in 1923, a loaf of bread cost 726 million marks. Obviously, destroy it, wipe them out. These crises, these crises are entirely man-made. They were deliberate. That may come as a shock. Their nation's leaders made them by creating unbacked paper money out of thin air. That's the case in each one of those hyperinflation examples I put there. The German one is the most dramatic and the most well documented. So what does this have to do with you and me today? Everything. Quite simply, everything. Why? Germany sank into the most severe hyperinflationary period in recorded history. After doing what? After printing 1.3 trillion marks. That translates in, in today's terms about $4 trillion in U.S. dollars. Okay? Ironically, the United States government has printed exactly the same amount of money since 2008. 
the same amount that brought the German hyperinflation has already been achieved by the U.S. Uh, behavior since 2008. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. I'm using America because it impacts everybody. But the, the problem is much bigger. That's only the tip of the iceberg, as they say. The European Union has printed five, over 500 billion euros. Equal, that's equivalent to about six, over 600 billion U.S. dollars. Japan has printed 180 trillion, notice that different word there, trillion yen, equal to about one and a half trillion dollars. The UK has printed th over 300 billion pounds, equal to almost half a bi uh, 500 billion, half a trillion dollars. Altogether, that's over six trillion dollars. See, the other thing I want to get across, and you've heard me of this before, but bear with me, we have a new vocabulary. There's a new word in our vocabulary that everybody uses, and I haven't fi I've yet to find anyone can explain it to me that really understands what a trillion is. Let's talk not dollars, some other abstraction. Let's talk seconds. Okay, I owe you some money. I'll pay you what I owe you in a million seconds. When you grab your calculator out and you discover a million seconds, well, that's 12 days. I can live with that. I'll pay you what I owe you in 12 days. You can deal with that. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I misspoke. I didn't mean a million seconds. I'll pay you what I owe you in a billion seconds. Well, you're a little concerned. You get out your calculator. What's a billion seconds? 32 years. I argue that that's not a quantitative difference. It's qualitatively different. You can live with 12 days, maybe even two or three times that, but not a thousand times different that. You go from 12 days to 32 years, going from million to billion, 12 days to 32 years. Oh, but excuse me, excuse me, I'm really not contemporary, contemporary here. I want to pay you what I owe you in a trillion seconds. You say, really? Yeah, a trillion seconds, how much is that? 32,000 years. I want that to sink in, because we use these words so casually. I've trafficked with legislators and executives that use the word trillion with no grasp of what it means. And uh, I remember I even had an occasion with Dr. Edward Teller. He and Norris Keeler were talking something and, and they were using the, 10 to the, the number 10 to the 15th for a certain purpose. And I said, wow, that's more than there are uh, seconds in the history of the universe. They both looked at me startled. I said, you do the math. You're the one that tell me that the you, you're the one that would tell me the universe is about 16 billion years old. Do the math. That's only 10 to the 15 seconds. And it stop, it shot, they, they use at Livermore and elsewhere these numbers all the time. That's their. But even there, without really grasping what you're dealing with, going from million to billion to trillion is going from 12 days to 32 years and 32,000 years as a measurement of time. We have no grasp. When we, when we talk about a trillion six dollars as our deficit, that's not our budget. That's the amount by which we're missing our budget by. It gets worse. Our insurmountable debt has been estimated about 222 trillion at last count. And that's by Lawrence Kotlikoff, which is widely regarded as the expert in this kind of thing. Why do you expect to it? And using the, the Congressional Budget Office numbers, using their numbers, he feels that our, our debt, the U.S. debt, is about 222 trillion. Why? Not the 17 trillion you heard about. That's the cash. That's the cash deficit. But there's over 200 trillion unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicaid, and entitlement programs. What does that all mean? Say there's over, that's over a half a billion dollars per person for every man, woman, and child in the United States. That's the enslavement that's already there. The U.S. government borrows four out of every ten dollars it spends. The McKinsey, who is arguably the largest, most prestigious management consulting firm in the world, has their uh, global institute has just recently calculated what they believe is the, t the amount of the total wealth of the entire planet Earth. Take all the wealth on the planet Earth and try to come up with an estimate of that. And they're, they're, they're experts at that sort of thing. And their estimate was that it's about $200 trillion. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute here. What you're telling me is 
that at $222 trillion, the current U.S. fiscal gap, or debt, is 11% larger than all the accumulated wealth existing in the world today. There's something out of whack here. Will that ever be repaid? Of course not. Not with any legitimate currency. And so, staggering, staggering stuff. You know, Rothschild is famous for saying, let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. That undergirds the whole Rothschild strategy from the 19th century on, and a very effective strategy. Karl Marx said much the same thing. He says, money plays the largest part in determining the course of history, and he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right about that. The encroaching darkness that we see coming, we need to look this in the eye as we continue to see corruption everywhere. We're in the age of deceit. We're in more ways than we probably enumerate. Throughout the highest levels of government, it's now common to cheat. In our entertainments, in our schools, and in many of our churches, everywhere you look. Not asking you to change it, just be aware of it, be sensitized to it. Many of those in the corridors of power should be incarcerated for treason. The congressman and senator took an oath of office to protect the Constitution, they don't. Legislators signed bills they haven't even read. That ought to be a treasonable offense. Executives are allowed to ignore the laws. Widespread, all, all kinds. Judges who reverse juries, amend laws, and indulge in social engineering rather than dealing with what they're called to do. Leaders who fail to exhibit the most elementary ethical conduct. Ethical conduct is an anachronism. I spent 30 years in the corporate boardrooms. That was not true back then. It certainly is today. The entertainment industry celebrates every imaginable evil and attacks the, all the family values which God has established for our welfare. The systematically is it under attack of those very things. The educational establishment deliberately dumbs down and corrupts our youth. The agenda in our nationally, national educational program is indoctrination, not education. There was a day you could rely on the fiduciary posture of our advisors, counselors, and professionals. Today, that would be naive and hazardous. Every day, the litany of non-constitutional abuses continues unabated. Every day, self-destructive policies extend their reach. Every day, it grows darker. Every day, the debts grow larger. They are already beyond any semblance of reality. But by the way, so let's be clear about this. It's not our job to predict the future. Divination is expressly prohibited in the Torah. Pro Bible prophecy is not given to predict the future. It's given to glorify God when it occurs. Big difference. Subtle, but very important. Pericles said it so well. All right, the key is not to predict the future, but to be prepared for it. You have no obligation to predict the future, but you do have an obligation to be prepared for whatever storms are coming. That's your responsibility. It is our responsibility to prepare for the coming storms, whatever they may be. And that should weigh heavy on the, the head of every household. That's an obligation. You can't escape. It's there. The Bible instructs us to not be ignorant of Satan's devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11. You've all heard that before. But that's an, that's an imperative. That's an assignment given to us by our Creator. To not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Paul develops this theme. He warns us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the reality. That's our challenge. And by the way, it's, it's for a better understanding of these forces that we will next explore some of the most bizarre events of America's history. There's some aspects of American history that may surprise you. And uh, it's going to impact every one of us. 
So in our next session, we're going to go into some areas that are going to be very, very controversial, very alarming, very disturbing. And yet I believe it's my, it's my view that it's important for us not to be deceived. There's an imperative by our Lord himself, be not deceived. How do you do that? By finding out the truth, finding out what's really going on. And in our second session, I just want to warn you in advance, it's going to be very disturbing, very surprising. You'll hear things you didn't know were true. And I'll not express opinions, I'll de demonstrate evidence that will surprise you. So that's, and also, I'll also indulge in some tutorials on some tools that may surprise you. We'll talk a little bit about Bayes' theorem and how that can be useful making some tests of what's going on. And with all that, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for bringing us together, and we thank you for your word. We solicit your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and lives to what you have here for us, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our coming King, that we might be more effective for, in dealing with the opportunities you bring in our path. We do pray, Father, that you would indeed open our understanding that we could be ever more effective for you as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations or concerns at all. We put ourselves in your hands in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, our coming King indeed. Amen.